Hello. How y'all doing? Can you all hear that? You'll hear that fine. How many we got in? 45 at the moment. Cool. Um, so I'll wait for a little while while we get to uh, get more people in. Um, it's been warm here in England over the past uh, couple of weeks, as I'm guessing everybody realize as everybody knows it's uh all around europe we're having a bit of a heat wave it's still pretty hot here in fact i've got the window open over there and a big air conditioning unit stuck through there and i'm so if i start sweating profusely <laughs> you'll have to excuse me because it's pretty um hot in here i'm in a my unit's an industrial unit really it's um quite big i've got like i've got a room in there and then i've got a room in here but it's got really high ceiling but it's all metal so um it's uh it gets really hot in the summer it gets mega hot and then in the winter it gets ridiculously cold so um yeah when i'm trying to record things uh, as you probably realized looking at the uh, videos that i've been putting up recently by the end of them i'm just like drenched in sweat so we've got a fair few coming in now 113 that's good so today I'm going to talk a little bit about technique and a very specific area of technique um, in uh, position shifting. So um, it's worth mentioning before I start with all of that, that this week I released the Prelude number no. one um, study piece course. Uh, in case you didn't know what those study piece courses are, I've released one of them already. Um, this is the second one. Uh, and they're basically classical pieces that um where you can focus on various aspects of technique i mean the great thing about them is that you get to learn a piece of music you know that you can play separately but it's it's a piece that you're going to be able to study over a prolonged period of time you know it's not the kind of thing you're just going to learn in a day you know these are things that you're going to be able to practice for quite a long time um so the first one that i did was the um you know, good old. Uh, the Prelude in G, Cello Suite, number one, um, by Bach. And now this one is the, let me put the reverb on for it. It's the uh, Prelude number one from the World Temple Clavier. Very, very famous piece. etc so um it's um yeah it's it's not the hardest piece in the world it's it's you know it's, it's basically just a lot of arpeggios um but very famous piece you can sit there and work through it and the courses are basically like having me sat there as a as a one-on-one -on -one tutor it's basically coaching you through the whole thing so because of that they're cut price you know they're not like they're not the same kind of price that uh, the other courses are you know the other courses are about 110 dollars most of the time you know like the big ones like Codson essentials and um all those kind of courses because they're big they're um areas of study um, that are, you know, you're getting the equivalent of hundreds of, of um, lessons, basically. It's like having hundreds of one-on-one -on -one lessons, you know, when you buy the normal courses. Um, but these ones are much shorter. There's probably only about 20, 30 lessons in each one. If that, actually, probably about 20. Um, so they, but the lessons are longer. So some of the lessons might be tw uh, 20 minutes long um, be where we work on a particular small section of the piece. So for instance, the first part, you know, I'll work through the first four bars, you know, that I just played before. 
uh, and then just work through them all, telling you all about all of the technique that you're going to need to work on, um, tips on all of the bits as you work through it. So, and I also do harmonic analysis on it, so that you get to know that that's uh, basically a C major. And that's a oops, D minor over C. Um, that's a G major of a B and then back to C. So, yeah, so it's uh, that's that's the course that's out at the moment. So it's discount. I think it's uh, down to thirty nine dollars. So that's over at the website. So if you're interested in that, then just go check that out. And what I'm going to do in this, um, let's say, masterclass that I'm going to do today is take a few bars from that piece and show you how you can work on your position shifting. Now, position shifting is a really important part of playing bass because, you know, when you talk, when you hear people moaning about not having big enough hands and things like that, uh, you know, stretching and all that stuff, you shouldn't really have to stretch at all on bass. Um, there's a few, ex a few examples where you might need to stretch, but not for basic bass lines. You know, if I was playing something like this, yeah, then I'm going to have to stretch for it because it's a... You can't get away from that because I've got to pull off. But if it, uh, or, or let's say something like this, you know, one of those kind of jacko kind of, those kind of things, then you're going to have to stretch a little bit more. But even with that, you don't have to do that much stretching. Most of it is to do with position shifts, fluid position shifts, being able to move from one area of the neck to another fluidly without any real, um, um break in in the, in the line you don't want you you want it to be fluid you don't want any any gaps or you don't want to be able to detect the actual the, you need to hide those position shifts um so that's what we're going to talk about today so how many people we got now we've got 173 i'll just say hello to everybody uh, let's just see who we've got in first and then i'll get to work on the lesson Thomas is in there. He's from the Netherlands. I've done it fairly late today. Um, I mean, it's not late for people in the States, but we're in, it's uh, it's only eight, it's eight o'clock in the evening here. I've just put the kids to bed and, uh, and then just driven up to the unit so I can do this. The missus is out tonight at a wedding. So uh, the in-laws are looking after the kids while I've uh, well, I put them to bed and I've just come to do this. Hello from Houston. Hi, Mark. Yep. Uh, as I've pointed, I've pointed out in the last few uh, the last few live streams, the uh, the move to Texas is not happening now. It was happening. We were almost there, but we've actually we've actually uh, brought an end to all of that. So I'm not going to be moving to the states after all. Um, staying over here in England. And, um, yeah, we've bought a house. <laughs> so I'm moving to a, a house um, that we've got, which is a massive... <laughs> we've bought a, but what, what could be a money pit. We've bought a, a house that needs a lot of renovating. So, uh, yeah, so that's going to be the, the main thing I'm going to be working on from now on. <laughs> and the, ba the place is basically a bomb site. Um... Hi, Philippe. Hi, Henry. Yeah, we've got quite a few people in here. Ch -ch -ch. Hello, everybody. I'm just working down through it. 21 degrees across the Solent. Yeah, so it's about 21 degrees. Yeah, just over there. Yeah, it's in here, it's probably about 30 degrees because it's, like I say, it's, it's like outside, it's very, it's very pleasant. But in here, it's just... So I don't know how long I'll last out. I mean, it's 10 past 8 now, so uh, 8 minutes past 8, so... Hopefully, I'll last out till nine o'clock. So I'll last, a, I'll last out an hour, hopefully. But uh, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Oliver says, uh, Hi, Mark. Bit of a weird question, but what would you say is the best beginner level 42, aka Mark King baseline to learn? Ooh. If you're looking to learn all those kind of Mark King slap things, then probably love games. Um. It's, um, is that right? Uh, <laughs> bomb, bomb. 
<laughs> I'm trying to remember the damn thing, but I know it's like that. I, f I forgot the line. <laughs> <laughs> I get so used to doing these, those kind of things. Anyway, love games is the one to do. Um, I've kind of drawn a blank on it now because I'm, I'm thinking of one particular um, figure in the uh, in the open E. But really, you just want to learn to get uh, the, for for a lot of those Mark King things. You get a lot of that, you know. All kind of uh, lines and love games is probably the most straightforward of those kind of locomotive style open e you know giving it the left hand slab the hell is it I can't believe I've just completely drawn a blank on it. I've played it loads of times. But I've got a, a, a figure in my head like a rhythm and I can't get it out of it. Hi, Papa G from London. Best regards from Mexico, Hector Gaza. Are there beginning marking pieces? Well, that one is pretty much. It depends. It depends how long you've been playing. I mean, if you're a proper absolute beginner, then yeah. I mean, I wouldn't even bother. Uh, you, you're gonna want to learn some other bass lines first. You know, if you if if the most you've ever done is this, you know, or <laughs> if that's as far as you've got so far, then. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't start on any Mark King stuff yet. How many bases have you got? Uh, I don't know. One, two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. About fifteen. doing my head in that I can't remember the damn line for uh, for love games hold on this is annoying me so much that I just want to check something and I can think of the whole drum beat in my head I can think of the whole it's all there in my head I'm trying to remember the figure um kind of that so if you're looking for a more of a beginner kind of so I was I was kind of right with the bar, 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 bar bit I just couldn't remember that last that last bit um, oh back at the Ibanez yeah that's a, that's at home have you considered a transcription course the pitch part is fairly straightforward but as in sight reading getting the rhythms written correctly is much more involved um, well that's where if you're wanting to learn how to write music really you need to learn to read music first it's a bit like if you wanted to learn to write you know like it, 
you know, like if you're learning English as a kid, you know, you you want to, or whatever language you're learning, it, you've got to learn how to, you've got to learn the language first. So, uh, but um, the, I've got the combination of the tra- of the ear training course and then the simple steps to sight reading course. I'd say the simple steps to sight reading course is the one to go with. That that will give you all of that um, knowledge, basically. Anything to do with reading is in simple steps to uh, sight reading. Ba, ba, ba. Where in England are you? Uh, Isle of Wight. I'm from Wakefield, which is in Yorkshire, West Yorkshire. Um, for those of you that know the story about me and Scott Divine over at Scott's Bass Lessons, we both were at um, Wakefield College together doing a post-grad. That's when we first met. So he lives in Leeds. I lived in Wakefield. We're all from that area. Um, even though Scott's from Carlisle originally. Hi, Rene from Portland, Oregon. Changing the name to Mark Smith's talking hammer house renovation channel. Yeah, it's going to be like Combs Under the Hammer. Crowdfund the house renovation. Well, up in exchange for lessons. Yeah, so what I'm going to need, I'm dreading the amount that it's going to cost me. It's, um, honestly, the, there's like, the... There's not even a sink in the kitchen. You know, I mean, the, the people have been living there, but there's no sink in the kitchen. We're going to have to knock through the utility room into the kitchen to actually make it so there's a sink. Um, like the seat of the roof needs doing, the garden's just a bomb site. The, honestly, the whole place just needs... I mean, there's no light fittings in there at all. The, the electrics are shot. The whole electrics need doing. The guttering needs doing. It's the, the whole thing, the, the front... Um, drive needs completely redoing. It's uh, it's a mess. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but it'll be good once it's done. Uh, there's a lot of potential. Uh, that's kind of what I saw in it. But it's going to be uh, yeah, it's going to take a few years for us to get it done. Don't worry, I'm going to get onto this stuff in a second. UFC Paddy lives part-time here in San Diego. Does he? What? Paddy Pimlet? Why don't you have an evaluation for new students and then have a recommendation course? Well, I have often thought about that, but I wouldn't be able to do that personally. I mean, there's just too many. I mean, the, the, the problem that you get at any point when these things start to get... But, you know, I mean, it's nine years now that Talking Best has been going. You can imagine the thing has got quite out of control that if i wanted to do personally this is why i don't do one-on-one base lessons anymore i just i just don't have the time um i get asked about it all the time and i'm like i just i just don't have the time um if i wanted to do a personal evaluation of people it i just wouldn't have the time to do it um i wouldn't even be able to employ if i employed a bunch of people a team to do it there just wouldn't be enough time there's like 120,000 people signed up on the website so it, i mean it's it, there'd just not be any time if I could set up some kind of automated system for doing it, then that would be the way to do it. But that's very difficult. I have thought about putting a test together so that then you can evaluate yourself through the test. And through the test, you know, maybe put how long you've been playing, all these different things, and then and then recommend a course based on that. But if you go to the courses page on Talking Bass, there's a big video there that, that lays out exactly what... Uh, courses you should do in what order people never see that it's actually and in the faq section on the members area there's a whole thing laid out telling you what uh, what order to do the courses Uh, any opinion on playing with nails, playing classical guitar as well? Um, a girl that I used to teach was a classical guitarist um, uh, she was at music college and she um, had a problem there picking and she'd got like long nails for it and she ended up cutting her nails down a little bit but it was it was hard trying to trying to go between well trying to do classical guitar as well as bass you kind of just have to if you you have if you want to keep doing classical guitar like serious classical guitar you're really gonna have to keep your nails so 
there's not much you can do about that. You'd have to keep the nails and then just kind of deal with the extra tick, tick, tick that you're going to get when you're playing bass. Some people like that. I mean, you can use them for getting a fair bit of attack. Do you do lots of session work? I don't do anything at the moment. I don't do any gigs. I don't do any set recording stuff at the moment. I do nothing apart from this. It's like 24-7. So at the moment, I mean, I would do at the moment. I mean, I might put it out there at the moment because it's a long time since I've done any recording. A long time since I've done gigs. I mean, I've probably done about, what, two gigs in the last, like, four years. I mean, it's, I mean it didn't help that we've had COVID. But I'm just doing this all the time. So I, I don't get a chance to do anything. I had a chat with Scott Devine about this. We just never get to do any gigs at all. I mean, I did 20 years of just gigging every night before that. But I just, um, yeah, I just don't get a chance. I'm not that bothered because, like, to be honest, I'd kind of, I, I'd kind of had my fill. Uh, when, I, when I started doing Talking Bass and I'd, and I'd just finished doing a lot of gigging and I was kind of becoming a bit jaded, to be honest. Um, you can, I know it sounds silly, but it depends on the type of gig you're doing but i find that you can end up playing too much that you if you're doing the same kind of gigs as well you just become really really um sick of it it's like i, I just never had any time to myself and it was like you're always working on a night you're always gigging and so like all your friends are all like you know anytime that you might see anybody's going to be on a night and that and it i was starting to get a little bit just sick of the playing kind of thing. I think if I'd have been playing for Justin Timberlake or something like that, it'd have been a bit different. But general gigging, I, I just started to get a bit cheesed off. If I started gigging again regular now, um, I'd be a lot more into it because I've had a nice break. But I'd just been doing it for too too long, too much. Finishing up basic fundamentals, that's Robert. Uh, what do you recommend for next course? Probably Code Tone Essentials. Either Code Tone Essentials or Simple Steps to Sight Reading. Simple Steps to Sight Reading is the biggest course that I've got on the site. It's massive. I mean, there are hundreds of lessons. There is 25 hours worth of video, and there's about 700 pages of lesson material. It's massive. And it'll take you years and years and years to get through it all. There's no, I mean, it'd take, I'd say you've got a minimum of four or five years of study. to Because there's no way that... The, the stuff that, that I give on the final level of the course, there's no way that you'd be able to play that even within a year or two. It's 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 pretty advanced what it eventually gets you to. So th that simple steps to sight reading would be great uh, as a as a kind of long term study. Cortone Essentials is more of a, a theory based one. It's a harmony based one. So you learn intervals, you, uh, you learn chord construction, you, you you learn what every single chord you will ever see is. Not as, not as, you know, chords like that. You learn them as arpeggios. So you learn that a C major triad, a minor triad, major seven, dominant seven, you know, and, and everything else. Suspended chords, inversions, altered extended chords, you know, ex extended chords, nines, elevens, thirteens, flat thirteen, sharp eleven, blah, 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 blah. Um, six chords, add nine chords, six nine chords, you know, uh, seven sus chords, like everything you can imagine. Um, so that whenever you see a chord chart, you will know what those chords are. You'll know the notes in those chords. You'll know the, the notes of those chords all over the neck. And you'll know how to create bass lines from those chords. So, and how to uh, work around that chord tone framework with auxiliary notes, approach notes, and all those kind of things. So chord tone essentials is a pretty hardcore lesson, uh, course. Right, I'll get to, uh, I'll, I'll get to the to the uh i'll get to the uh lesson thing now is that an ibanez you play nope it's an enfield lionheart it's home for you the isle of Wight. i'm just whipping down to the bottom here so that i don't have to go back up again uh uh yes Man, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of um, comments. Could you do a lesson on analyzing a song and writing a part versus improvisation? I saw a Beato video where he mentions how Levin carefully analyzes a song to determine where to add bass that fills. Yeah, that's that's not a bad idea. Yeah. 
How much sight reading is basic level? How much is mid and advanced level? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean uh, how much is it to purchase it? I'm not sure what you mean. Um, hold on. Hit me with your rhythm stick. He's really hard to do. Do you have a tutorial for it? Yep. Uh, look up. Uh, what did I have it under? Something like the coolest bass line in the world ever. Something like that. Um, it is there. Um, uh, and I go through the whole thing. Um, and uh, hold on. Let me just check. The coolest bass line in the world ever. Yeah, the coolest bass line in the world ever. That if you if you search for that on Talking Bass, it's all there. And um, um, yeah, and the cool thing is Norman Watt Roy that plays bass on it. He watched that video. And uh, and he loved it. And uh, we've we've done an interview for him, but I've not released it yet. Uh, so uh, yeah, it was uh, it was really cool. So we've got I've got a bunch of interviews. We've got about another thirty interviews done that I've not released yet and not edited. So yeah, Norman What Roy um, is one of them. So um, ch -ch -ch. okay, what's your secret for not aging? No, I'm aging. My hair's getting on. I'm forty-seven. I'll be. Uh, yeah, so I'm faster. I'm just 47. I was 47 on the 3rd of June. Right, okay, so. Um, so, fretboard. So I'm going to be talking about uh, position shifting. Because that's one of the things that you really need to nail if you're... Um, well, it's just one of those things that everybody really needs to get used to because there's always that thing that people do where they're, you know, they're trying to play something like this and then they're, you know, they're saying, oh, I, I just can't stretch it and, and, and that. And, you know, if I've got to play something like this, oh, you know, I, 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 my fingers aren't big enough. It's like, well, you don't have to do that. You need to get used to fluidly shifting, right? So the uh, I'm going to give you an example of a line from that prelude that we've just released, uh, the study piece. And let's have a look at the first line that, uh, that I want to talk about. So I've put it up there. Let's move it so that it can... Let's put it there. Um, so this line um, sounds like this. Let me put the thing on. So that's the line. Okay, so we're moving up from this area here up to this area here. So I'll, I'll just go through the notes. So we've got a D and an A in this position. So this is first and third finger. So 10th fret on the E string, 12th fret on the A string. So you've got that perfect fifth, first of all. Then we're going to shift up with the second finger, the middle finger, to this D here at the... Um, 17th fret on the A string and then we're basically outlining a D7 chord so it's D, F sharp and then the C up on the top so 15th, uh, 17th fret on the A string uh, 16th fret on the D string and then 17th fret up on the G string So I talk about this a lot in the course, um, uh, in the in the technique primer that's uh, before the actual uh, coaching, um, because uh, I talk about note control because that's a big part of making these moves fluid. So what you want to be able to do is keep your is keep full note duration. Now, obviously in bass lines you don't always need full note duration, you know. You know, on a, some, 
get that off. You know, there I'm playing quite staccato. But you need to be able to play full note duration if you need to, and you need to be in control of that. So, so if you're going to play, let's say, a C major scale, okay, you want to be able to play full note duration for each note. And the thing that I see time and time again, and I never even realized this until I started teaching one-on-one -on -one tuition. I never realized that people had problems with this, and then it suddenly became a thing that I kept seeing all the time with students. I mean, this is from way back. Just like the first time I had students back in the 90s, I was like, man, these people have always got, you know, even fairly decent players, you know, that have been playing a while. I found that they were playing like this. You know, and everything was like, maybe not staccato, but like, but cutting the notes off before the move. That kind of thing. When in fact, you need to be able to do this. So it needs to be ba 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 instead of ba 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 no gaps. Paint the whole world. No. So um no matter what the speed So that's what you want to aim for. Now listen to the line that I just played again. So again, that's what we're aiming for. Now I am playing that top note a little bit staccato just to give it a little bit of a, a little bit of a, what, a bit of a tack, you know, and a bit of an accent on the apex of the line. But really when you're making these position shifts, that is, is where the, that's where it's going to be quite tricky because when you make the shift, you, the, the automatic thing that happens is that you end up stopping the note and then moving. So you get this gap. Can you hear the gap? I'll do it really slow. <laughs> you get that kind of effect. But what you want is this. So what... Well, the key to this with position shifts is to make that move at high speed. It's got to be bang, immediate. So when you make position shifts, do not move. And this, I mean, this comes, this, this is the same for any, anything, even if you're not doing position shifts. Don't play the next note until it's required. Okay, so if I'm going to play that C major scale, so I start with the C, I don't bring the finger down until the note is required. So if I'm playing eighth notes, one and, I don't move anything until that and. One and, I don't take the finger off before, it's not one and, two, you know, two and, three. It's not like that, it's got to be, you hold it and then make the move on the beat or on the and or whenever it's required. So when we do something like this, we don't make that shift there until that that high note is required. So let's say I'm playing. Oh, let's. Uh, well, it's semi quavers isn't it? Sixteenth uh, note. So one e and. So that and there. One. So one e and. Can you see how I'm shooting that finger up? So even when you're playing slow, you've got to make the move fast. And in fact. There's no real difference in the in the speed that you make the move, whether it's fast or slow. You've just got to make this very sudden shift. You got to, and you've got to watch where you're moving to. So I'm I'm focusing on this area here, and then I shift my focus before I make the move. I shift my focus to here and attack it. And I'm kind of switching, I'm kind of flipping the finger over. This is a lot easier when you're using 
separate fingers. If you've got to use the same finger for the jump, then it's really difficult, which is why in working out a fingering for something like this, it's a lot easier if you actually have a different finger to move to. So shifting from that third finger to the second finger is, is the best way to play it, okay? So you can isolate the move. So I'm playing the A there and then the D. There's always going to be an element of messing it up, but... And we want that to be held until the notes required. You see how I'm, even when I'm playing slow, I'm making the move fast. Whoops, I <laughs> messed it up. And you've got to look at where you're going and aim at it. Okay, so then practice that line slowly with fast position shifting. In the picking hand, I'm alternate picking. So I'm starting on the middle finger. So let's see if you can see it. I've got shorts on here. Oh. Pusses, pusses, um, I've got my pusses um, shorts on. It's from my cruising days when we used to be in Tortola all the time. Pusses bar there. Um, so um, I'm picking with the middle finger and then just alternate picking every time. So we have second finger, first finger, second finger, first finger, second finger. So we're on the second finger when we get up onto that top note, which allows us to come back down onto the first finger, second finger, first finger and then back. And this is why classical pieces like this, even though they're not very stereotypically bass, are really, really good for technique because you don't get this kind of movement that often in regular bass lines. You know, so if I'm going... You know, you just don't get it in there. Whereas this... You know, it's, it's, you get these huge big moves, right? So that's a fairly um, easy shift. I mean, it, <laughs> I know it's not that easy, but it's uh, out of that prelude, it's one of the easier shifts, and it's quite early on. Uh, after you've played that, it goes to to the G major. Um, so now let's move on to one of the bigger stretches. So we'll go for the for the hardest one in the piece. So, uh, which I think would be this one. Yep, this one. So if you've got a bass there, you know, if you're all sat there with basses, you can try playing along. So, so for this one, um, we've got... So at full speed... So we've got an octave, first of all, so it's an F there, so first fret on the uh, E string, third fret on the D string, with the first and fourth finger, so index and pinky. Regular old octave. Again, I'm starting on the second finger in the picking hand, alternate picking all the way. And then we've got this shift, so we've got the fourth finger there on the F at the third fret, Shifting up to the second finger at the seventh fret of the D string. Okay. So that's your first problem right there. Now, even if you're a complete beginner, right? Maybe not, maybe not an absolute beginner, but even if you've not been playing a long, long time, um, this is still okay to practice. Don't think that just because you're you haven't been playing a long time you know, that this is not going to apply to you. This is good stuff to practice right from word go because at no point are we having to do big stretches or anything like that. This is simply moving the hand up the fretboard. You know, and, it's, and I've got to say, it's really frustrating when you first try doing it because you're going to, you're just going to be inaccurate and gradually you'll increase your accuracy. Obviously, you don't want to be... 
you're not going to be playing it super fast to begin with. You just want to start very slowly. So we've got that, and then we have C and the E up on the G string. So we've got fifth fret to the uh, ninth fret there. So we come up. So F, F, then A, C, E, okay? So, like I said, first fret, E string, third fret, D string, up, move up with the second finger to the A there at the seventh fret of the D string. First finger, the index finger, takes the C at the fifth fret of the G string. And then the fourth finger, the pinky, takes the E at the ninth fret of the G string. And then you just repeat those last three notes. Now, when you've made the move up to that A, there, so we've, we've done that. There's no stretching involved at all. I'm just playing a regular old, you know, three fret stretch there. Shift up with that second finger. We land on this good old A here. Then what we're going to do is use pivoting to make up for this stretch here. Because the first thing you'll do is this. You'll be trying to, to, to make the stretch. Now, I can do it. And, you know, if you've, if you've been playing a long time, you probably will be able to do it. It's not a massive stretch. But... Some people can't, and, you know, if you've not been playing long, you won't have the technique to cover that. So, what you need to do is, if I've got my thumb there in the back of the neck, roughly behind, what's that, the, uh, one, two, three, four, five, like the sixth fret, yeah, it's the sixth, of course it's the sixth fret, <laughs> counting the frets, one, two, three, so, <laughs> the thumb slip behind the sixth fret, right, and, um, and then look at what you can do with the thumb. So I've got the thumb there. It's in the back of the neck. So it's roughly midway between this edge and this edge. I've got the second finger on that, um, that A there with the seventh fret. But I can, I can pivot the thumb that way in order to get the C at the fifth fret of the G string. Okay? Then I can pivot again this way to get the E there at the ninth fret. So I'm not, I'm not stretching at all. I'm just using the arc of that thumb and the pivot to play those. Now, what will happen when you first try this is that you'll probably play a note and then take it off and then move. So, you know that note uh, controller I was talking about before where you want full note duration? You'll mess that up. So it'll be gap, play, gap play, gap, play, like that. But what you want is this. So remember what I said about that move up there when I said about you move on the note? Same thing here. Don't make the move, don't make the arc there until the note's required. So if I was to just play between those two notes, the C and the E, using that pivot, and I played eighth notes, one and two and three and four and I'm making the move the that move across on each and or you know each eighth note one and look for when I make the move I'm holding it there I'm holding it right up to the time up that uh, the next note's required one and I don't move until and one and and then back two and three and ba 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 not ba 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 na 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 siren <laughs> Be amazed at what you can do with those pivots. I mean, that's a bit extreme, but <laughs> you know, you can really get a lot of twist in that pivot. Now, obviously, that is a silly extreme, but if you can, if you can get it from a C up to an A you know, <laughs> with the pivot, then moving from C to E is really not that big. You want to stretch out the fingers as much as you can, just so that you don't have to pivot as much. You know, to make sure that the fingers are parallel with the frets as well. Don't be coming in like this. 
you know, <laughs> you want your fingers parallel. So, and you should do that. Okay, so now we have simple octave pattern, position shift, you know, on the, on, moving on the nose there, pivot, 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 so, pivot to get back to the A, sorry. So. each one of those notes is moving into the next now there is a little bit of a gap when i move back down it's it, it's hard to do that one down to there you've really got to jump down uh, but luckily the f is right down there where the the nut is so you can actually just jump the slam the hand back down there and just hope for the best kind of thing but you know it's hard to get back down but you won't really notice that when you're playing at speed. So if I put the reverb on as well, that kind of covers everything up, so... Okay, so that's another big position shift. And all these things, once you get used to doing this, will make a massive difference when you're trying to learn regular old bass lines. You know, where you, you might have a little bit of a stretch here and there. Or so when, when you're doing something like a scale, you know, like if you were doing, like, let's say, a B-flat natural minor scale starting on the first fret here. I mean, for whatever reason you might do that. I don't know why you would, but let's say you had to. Instead of sitting there and thinking, okay, well, I've got to stretch the hand like this. You don't. You can pivot with that thumb. You know, if, even if I keep all the fingers fairly close together. As long as the note control's good and the duration, all that stuff I was saying about actually moving when required, you'll be fine. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not stretching the hand out. I can. Oop, uh. You know, if I had to play like a silly stretch for, I mean, there's no reason to do that, but like, you know, because I can stretch, but but I, I never do. There is no point. Position shifting is the way. Uh, and it's the reason that I've talked to um, people about, you know, short scale basses. Short scale basses are great. Uh, and if you've got really tiny hands, then yep, go for it. They're, they're a good solution to that problem. But they're not essential. You can, even if you're tiny. And as I've said before, one of my friends, um, I see him most weeks, is a professional bass player from down here on the island. I've known him years and years and years. He's uh, He's been playing since the 19, what, 1950s. Um, and he's always had a massive, big old Fender Precision from back then. And, um, you know, he's, he's tiny. He's about, what, four foot ten? Five foot max. I think he's, I think he's shorter than five foot and he's got tiny hands. But he can play the hell out of that precision. He has no problems. Because it's all position shifting. You, you don't always feel that you've got to, oh, I, I can't play that because I haven't got a stretch. Like I said, there are things. You know, if you're going to have to play pull-offs, yeah, th then you're going to need a stretch. But how often are you going to be doing that in a song? I mean, how many times have I done that in a song? Probably never. <laughs> You know, so, um, you know, you don't, you don't need to do that. So, so that's another line. And bear in mind, all of these lines are from that prelude that is currently on sale over at Talking Bear. So if you really want to get into this stuff, you know, because th this piece is absolutely full of this stuff. Um, that's the course to go for uh, at the moment. Um, I've also got the Technique Builder course, which is, um, which covers a lot of this stuff, you know, stretching a wide interval, wide register, uh, and wide interval um, stretches um, but you know so even even this that's a that's a position shift right there position shift that's not oh, well it is I, I suppose Here comes the uh, the D one. 
It says messing it up. <laughs> Again, position shifting. get to this chestnut so we get this one let's have a look at one more so move it across a bit so bearing in mind all those things that i've already just talked about next one so this time we've got f sharp to c down at the bottom second fret on the e string then the third fret on the uh, on the a string so tritone so we got that diminished chord and then we come up to the a and the c up there on the uh on the g string so i'm using first and second finger down here for those two and then i've got a and c up at the top so the second fret and fifth fret on the g string first finger and fourth finger then position shift pop up there so I shift from the fourth finger to the, sorry, fourth finger to the second finger there from the C to the E flat. So fifth fret on the uh, G string up to the eighth fret on the D string. So that's, that's the position shift to master. And again, you can isolate the move if you need to. See when it's, when it's really slow, you make the move fast. Wait till required. Then make the shift. It's all about fast twitch muscle fibers. <laughs> and then we've got A, C uh, on the, so I'm taking it from there to move it up to here. So 7th fret, 10th fret on the, um, on the D string. And then you just repeat those three notes. So again, all pretty straightforward in terms of the stretching that you don't even have to pivot hardly at all you just have to make that position shift and it's and like i said easier when you use different fingers you know when you when you have to use the same finger for the for the shift that's when it's tricky but um or, or just silly there's no point in doing it with the same finger but you always want to aim to do it with two separate fingers See, you can take a single bar from the piece and just use it as an exercise. This is where playing this kind of stuff, you suddenly realize how, um, you know, when people uh, like you'll get shred guitarists that will play like lightning fast lines and stuff. And you realize that a lot of those kind of rock lines that people play, you know, you typical um, all those kind of very scalar patterns and very sort of bluesy bluesy kind of lines they're dead simple because they're just really they fall under the fingers really easy whereas these kind of things you just need to get them under your fingers fast is so much harder because you've got string skipping involved you're using wide intervals it's not the kind of stuff that you can just like play at warp speed you know getting back down there is a nightmare but it's all good for your technique. So, like I said, after you've played there, uh, blah, 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 then down to this one. Whoops. Pivot. Um, forgetting it. 
So that's that prelude in C. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just great for your technique. If you wanted to improve your technique, um, those kind of pieces, like I say, it's a study piece. It's not in, you're not you're not supposed to learn it overnight. It's something that you can sit there learning for weeks and weeks. It could take you years, um, and uh, or maybe not years, but like you know. And and also, you get so good at at, at playing arpeggio based lines. Oh, dear me. You know, because it's all wide, wide interval kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, so that prelude number one from the well-tempered clavier um, is uh, is wicked. It's uh, you might know the Stu Ham version of it. He taps it. A lot of people tap it. Um, with good reason it's it's one of those pieces that because there's a lot of those large shifts you don't you know you don't really want to be doing them it's a lot easier if you tap it um but uh and, and Stu Am sounds amazing playing that um and you'll find a lot of covers of it on youtube but i re i arranged it specifically just so that i could play it as single note lines like that and um there's a harmonic analysis that I make of it as well, so you get to know what all the chords are uh, as it's working through. Um, and then if you like that one, then there's the Prelude in G that I was telling you about. So um, those kind of pieces, they're, they're really good to, for getting your hands just um, used to these big moves and cleaning up lots of areas of technique. Um, you know, and it's not the kind of thing... Yeah, I mean, it's so far removed from playing. <laughs> it's, it's just not... It's not like a normal bass line. But, if you, but trust me, if you can play this kind of stuff, like these preludes, uh, like cl classical repertoire... It's going to make everything so much easier for you in terms of learning regular old bass lines. Um, and that's not to say that you have to stop learning bass lines. Keep doing everything that you were doing. You just add this. It's supplementary. So like I said, that uh, Prelude Number 1 study piece course is on sale now. It's about $39. So it's pretty cheap. It's over at um, uh, Talking Bass. So you can go and buy that and then you just sign into your account and uh, it'll be there in the My Courses page. And uh, I can't remember how many lessons there are. There's about 12 lessons. There's, there's a module full of uh, technique lessons. Basically, this kind of thing, you know, about the uh, position shifts and that. Uh, and then, and it gives you a full history of the actual piece and the well-tempered clavier and bark. And um, then it also, there's a little bit on how to arrange these kind of pieces for bass as well. And then the coaching is over about 10 lessons, something like that, over the whole piece. Each lesson is about 15, 20 minutes long, and I break every single bit down, really hammering it, you know, the technique side of it. Um, yeah, I started learning these things very early on when I was playing. Uh, I remember one of the first pieces I actually learned, uh, you know, because I was learning like Megadeth and Pantera tunes when I first started, because it was, I started playing in 1990. And um, what was out then, I, mean, I was into metal stuff and rock stuff, and I was learning Iron Maiden tunes. You know, one of the first ones I learned was um, you know, Clairvoyant. And then I was in a band with uh, some friends of mine from school, and we were learning. We just we didn't have a singer. We just used to learn all these songs, you know, without a singer. So we'd learn, like, I remember learning Lucretia by Megadeth from the Rust in Peace album. Um, we learned <laughs> Orgasmatron by Motorhead, and I sang that one. Um, we learned Stone Cold Crazy by Queen. We learned Sweet Caroline by Status Quo. A real weird mashup of tunes. Uh, what else did we learn? Mouth for War by Pantera. I remember when that came out, and we were like, oh, man, that's cool. We'll learn that. So we learned that. Uh, just all that kind of stuff. And I think one of the first... No, one of the first bass lines I learned was... Black Knight by Deep Purple. So I was into all that kind of stuff. But then, um, 
I mean, I, I was into improving my technique because I was also massively into Billy Sheehan and Stu Ham. I remember that everything changed when I got the Stu Ham slap, pop, and tap for bass thing. <laughs> and I remember seeing him go, you know, doing all that and then. He did all that stuff and the uh, uh, I saw him doing that and I was like, oh man, this guy's unbelievable. I'd never seen anything like it. And um, so I, st I just became obsessed learning all that, all, all that stuff. I was just like obsessed with him. And then I got the Billy Sheehan one. Now I knew Billy Sheehan was supposed to be amazing and I'd, I'd heard him on Eatman Smile. I'd got the David Lee Roth album. And then he... And when I was just starting to play, Mr. Big had just come out. So I remember seeing Addicted to That Rush, and it was doing... And I was like, oh, man, what is he doing? And I remember learning how to do that. You know, and all that kind of thing. And then and then I got his one of his instructional videos, one of those uh, Cherry Lane things, you know, with Wolf Marshall doing the, the interview. And uh, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. <laughs> I was like, this guy's crazy. And so I just became obsessed with Billy Sheehan. But at the same time, because I got suddenly got into technique and I was wanting to do all that, uh, this was like really early on, you know, like this is within the first year of playing pretty much. So it was like 1990, 1991. I was about, what was I, 15, 16. And then um, I remember learning... Um, uh, just from a tape, because I'd got all these, my dad had got all this classical stuff, so I just ended up learning. You know, I learned that, and um, with all the... However it goes now, I can't remember. Uh, so I, I learned uh, Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor, and that used to be my party piece that I used to play. I didn't play it particularly well, to be honest. But it was one of those things that I started learning. I thought, oh man, I can learn classical pieces on bass. And uh, and that's where all of that started. Uh, and then to get into music college, I ended up learning that. You know, the one that I did with Ariane. Uh, in case you've not seen it, me and Ariane Cap did a duet um, version of that, which, uh, so go check that out if you like it, um, which uh, is the second prelude from the Well-Tempered Clavier. So that prelude number one, that's the first one. But the second prelude, uh, I learned that um, to get into music college, uh, which was about 1993. So I've been playing about three years at that, that point, And I worked my ass off to, to get that down. And um, so, yeah, I learned that in 1993. And then this last year, well, year before last, it was during lockdown, wasn't it? Um, me and Ariane were trying to think of something that we could do as like a duet. And that's when I said, oh, let's try that. So I'd not, I'd not played it since about that time, since about 93. So, yeah, those kind of pieces, they really helped me out when I first started. Because you, you start focusing on aspects of your technique that you just wouldn't normally think of when you're just learning regular old bass lines. You really end up pulling apart your finger picking. Because if you're trying to alternate pick all the time, you you know, you try an alternate pick. But then you suddenly realize there's areas where you need to rake and you, and you have to... Really pay attention to that and have little waypoints where you think, okay, I'm going to rake there, I'm going to alternate pick here, because you want it to be the same every single time you play it. Otherwise, to all intents and purposes, you're practicing a different piece, you know, if you're using different fingers and different, you know, for, for different notes. So, um, yeah, those things really, really helped me. So that's one of the reasons that I've done these study pieces, just to, you know, maybe if you're into that kind of thing and you want to, you know, improve your technique or whatever, um, it's there for you. So, uh, what time is it? It's nine o'clock, so we've just done an hour with that stuff. So I'll just, I won't go right back up to the top because I'll be here forever. Um, let's see what we've got here. See what everybody was saying. Probably everybody's just saying, what the hell is he talking about? Why is he telling me about this stuff? Why is he talking about classical music? Right, I'll 
go up to there and I'll work my way down. So Thanks, Samantha. I've just seen your nice comments. That's Samantha Margerison. Margerison. Uh, starting with five strings, this is Emerson. It looks a little uh, a different instrument. How do you think about the fretboard with that additional string? Check out a lesson that I've got about starting on five string. I try not to. I I don't like playing five string. I've got I've got a couple, but and I used to have to play five all the time on gigs because uh, especially theatre gigs because they always have stuff written for five strings. So I just. Uh, but I've never just I've never I just like playing four. I've I've always been a four stringer at heart. But you just have to get used to it. The, the best way to do it is by learning if learning the notes on the bass, basically. So if you don't know all the notes on a four string, um, that's how I find my way around the instrument. I know every single note on the neck and have done for 30 years or so. So, well, 25 years or whatever. Um, so I navigate by note. Uh, and so when I play a five string, I want to know what all those notes are. Um, if all you do is look at it from some kind of weird pat uh, geometric pattern uh, perspective, then it starts to get a little bit harder because then you've, you're having to... Uh, you, well, in some ways, I suppose that could be easier because then you've just... All you do is add the string. Um, but, yeah, personally, for me, I, I, I see it as notes. And that, so I basically want to learn the notes on that B string. You're now playing the F much shorter, not a D just to point it out, it's perfectly permissible. I pointed that out. Um I was I was purposely accenting the top note in the in you know, on some of them just to uh accent that apex of the of the line. But sometimes it's gonna sometimes you're not gonna be able to get that you know, the full note duration. It's just it's just gonna be impossible when you're coming down, you know. You know, there, it's just hard to get down. And when you get up to that and you've got to jump down, there's, I mean, you've got, you've got to allow for a little bit of it when there's, but let's say you're just moving between two notes like this. That's, you know, that's basically what I'm going for. It's not that every single note all the time has got to be full note duration. It's not a rule. It's just that you want to aim to be able to do that, to be in control of it. You want to be in control of what you're playing. Um, you know, you don't want the instrument to be dictating what you, um, or your technique to be dictating what you're doing. But like I say, if that's something that is just a ridiculous jump or something, sometimes you can't do anything about it, you know. Uh, aren't level 42 from the Isle of Wight? Yes, they are. Uh, Mark King lives about two miles down the road. Um, believe it or not, I've met him a couple of times, but never on the island. <laughs> it's always at trade shows. But he, he lives in a place called, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you where he lives, but he lives in a place called Alveston Garden Village down there. Um, he lives. He goes to the pub next door to my in-laws all the time. He loves it. It's a, a pub called the Pointer Inn. There I am. I'm telling you exactly where you can go find him. So it's like... <laughs> He's always at the pointer in, so he likes it there. And um, he's uh, yeah. Everybody keeps saying you need to get an interview with him here, which I would do, but it's hard to get in touch with him. I know loads of people that know him really well, so I I ought to, but um, he's not the easiest person to get in touch with. Um, I could just rock up at his door, but he's got a massive house down. It's like a big drive. I feel a bit awkward going. <laughs> going up there the house he used to have this gigantic bloody mansion the place because uh, he downsized but this massive place is right opposite where uh where we're moving to you know that house i've just bought it's you can uh on the there's a there's a thing online um showing you the house that he used to have and in the background you can see that one that we've just bought it's really obvious because it's white is the one that we've bought it's about 10,000 times smaller than one he's got. <laughs> uh, 
after you said the reverb covers up, oh, is everybody talking about the reverb and the fact that we're putting reverb on? I was just putting reverb on just to make it sound a little bit nicer. But if I'm practicing, I tend not to. So, because it covers everything up. So, if I really want to know if I'm nailing that, you know, I won't have that reverb on. Because if I put the reverb on, all of a sudden everything just sounds lovely and lush. You know, that's performing it. Whereas if I take it off and I'm trying to make everything very strict. But I do tend to accentuate those top notes on there. Um, but yeah, that's that's the reverb thing. I talk about reverb a lot in the course as well. I have a lesson devoted to it and about when to use it, when not to use it, and blah, 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 what settings to use and stuff. Uh, do you do Mick Khan Japan tutorials? I haven't done any yet, but I might do some because he was amazing. Like a really unique, fretless guy. I love the stuff he did with Terry Bozio and... Um, who was it? Was it David Torn? Um, the Polytown thing that they did. I used to have that CD. I used to love that. Hello, you're my favourite bass teacher. Thank you very much. Sounds like that. That's because it is. Bart probably didn't see me, is it? Yep. Are you recording? I just drive and feel like I missed a lot. Yep, you did. And uh, it is recorded. This, this, this will be here forever. It's uh, as soon as I, you know, stop recording. It's, it's just there, like any old video. Yep, and there we go. People talking about him with David Tarn. Alan Oldsworth played Spaceman Lines. Yep, he did. Oh, and there's somebody mentioned in Polytown. Wickle, love your duo, the, um, Ariane Cap. Yep, thank you very much. Adam Neely does a great rendition of Prelude and G for bass solo during Sun Gazer concerts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he has a really nice um, take on that. Um, I mean, if you've seen mine that I do online, it's um, I've, I've, I've got two. I mean, there's the one. Um, so obviously there's... Uh, there's that one that I do. In fact, what fingering did I use? For? Uh, there's there's one that I do down uh, on, for the course. I'd play it down here so that people with 20 fret basses can play it. But the one that you'll see me playing was like about nine years ago when I first started the channel, and I'm and I'm playing it all up here just as regular single notes. I'm not doing the. Oops. Um, a lot of people play it chordally. Adam plays it chordally. But um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a really lovely piece, and Adam plays it gorgeous. Um, do you have a good rec uh, a recommendation for good bass headphones for transcription? Not really. Um, I, what are these? These are Samson SR850s. They're, they're all right. They're very transparent. Um, um, I'll tell you one thing worth looking at is la 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 dot AI that I talk about in the Mustang Sally video that I released yesterday. Have you all seen the Mustang Sally thing that I did? 
Um, if not, go check that out because uh, I talk about how to how you can extract bass from a, a recording using an online service, um, which is what I did with Mustang Sally, and that's when I found out about the. Uh, The fact that it's a very strange bass line because <laughs> people normally play it and it's over a C and the first note's actually a B leading in so uh, go check out that if you've not seen it yet Terry is a more interesting drummer absolute animal yep I am a massive Terry Bozio fan when at first um, I, I when I was first learning to transcribe things and, uh, and that, because obviously I'm a Frank Zappa nut, um, I, uh, I used to transcribe Terry Bozio drum uh, solos because, you know, there's a lot going on in those. <laughs> uh, yep, Technique Builder's good for overall technique. Uh, blah 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 blah. Oh, there's a lot of. Uh, let me go back up to here. Uh, does your media player have a custom? All oh, right, they're talking amongst yourselves. Uh, you're studying about helps. I'm not in classical music, but there are a lot of bass lines which can be used as exercises. Um, let's get further down. I prefer the support, the sepulture recover of orgasmatron. Yeah, and that's how I sang it when I was doing it. I am the one, Orgasmatron. Yeah. Sounded ace. <laughs> uh, when did you start hearing about Patty Tucci and Marcus? Oh, uh, very early on. Um, it, but, because uh, I used to have all the bass player magazines, you know, and I'd just be seeing, but it just seemed like something way off, you know, like I remember seeing John Patty Tucci uh on on it was on the cover of one of them early 90s probably about 92 93 and i just remember reading all this stuff he'd got about like altered chords and i was just, it was just so over my head you know um and i didn't get to hear that much marcus even though i was hearing him you know um uh, you know because i was hearing you know him playing with all kinds of people uh, especially Luther Vandross, so he was in the charts at the time, and I was like, um, like never too much, and I was, I didn't know that was Marcus Miller, uh, and then, but obviously I got into them a lot more. I got into a lot of stuff when I got into music college because you just hear more stuff, you're just mixing with other musicians more, and um, and you, you study jazz, so I was just hearing a lot of jazz, you know. Which music college did you go to? Uh, Leeds College of Music. Um, back then. It was one of the only jazz courses in the whole of Europe. So we used to have like loads and loads of people coming from all over the place. You know, a bit like Berkeley, as people coming from all over the world, you know. Well, Leeds was like that. We had some like really cool teachers there. And every time anybody was coming over to um, to England, they'd come and do like little master classes and stuff there. So you'd get people like McCoy Tyner coming and, and that. It was It was great. What would be the first classical piece you would recommend to study? Um, well, I mean, there's those two that I've done there, the, uh, the cello suite and G, but if you're a beginner, you really want to be doing stuff like... Uh, you know, minuet in G, that's, that's one. Or just completely playing that by ear then. <laughs> Uh, so that'd be one, um, um, and I just, I'm going to do a set of study pieces for uh, beginners, uh, like a pack, because they won't be as long. You know that Prelude Number One and Prelude and the and the Cello Suite one, they're fairly long. So I'm going to uh, do a, a bunch of shorter ones, like uh, you know maybe a pack of five, um, a course showing five of them. Jesu uh, Joy of Man's Desiring is good. Um, that Minuet in G, and probably a few others. Is your hometown green got a rough blue color town or more yuppified? What me? No, I was. <laughs> I'm from Yorkshire, 
So uh, yeah, it's more uh, yeah. It, Wakefield is not um, a yuppie town. <laughs> Just look up Wakefield. I tell you what, best way to learn about what Wakefield's like, where I'm from, is to uh, look up a guy called Paul Sykes. Look up. Um, just put into YouTube, Paul Sykes documentary. Watch that. That tells you all you need to know about Wakefield. Yeah. Paul Sykes lived down the road from us. It's got one of, like, Wakefield's got one of the biggest uh, council estates in the whole of Europe. It's, um, yeah, it, 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 I mean, it's my hometown, you know, like, uh, you know, from there. But it's, um, you know, it's not the, uh, it's not, it's not bad, but it's, um, it's a mining town, basically, and all the mines closed in the 1980s, so uh, everybody was just out of work. And um, yeah, go check out the Paul Sykes documentary. He's like this one of the most dangerous prisoners in the, uh, or was, he's dead now. But he, but um, yeah, I've had a couple of run-ins with Paul Sykes over the years. Um, check it out. You'll see him saying a, there's a few cool quotes from it. Sharks. I'm just hoping that loads of you are going to go and watch that Paul Sykes documentary now. You've just got to check it out. <laughs> and then think of me. Um, um, you ever see Sade around about? Why does Sade live on the other white? I haven't, but I didn't know that. Benedict Cumberbatch apparently lives re local. Uh, right, I'll go further down. I'll finish up in a minute. I'm just getting to the end of the um, comments. Favorite effect pedal or pedals? Um, I don't really have any. I don't. I, oh, I've got a lot of pedals, but I don't have enough favorite. Why do bassists use reverb? Given and cellists don't. Um, half of the time, it's because what happens is that a lot of these things end up being performed in churches and things like that. So there's always like a natural reverb that you get. Um, so it's kind of just to get that. And on cello, it's going to be played with a bow. Um, so you're just not going to have that overall sound on, on it. Same with double bass. You know, you hear bowed double bass and cello, it just has a completely different sound. Have you ever played Warwick basses, Mark? I've never had one, but I've played some. Yeah, the, um, Warwick are great. Even though some people say Warwick. What's your opinion about carbon fiber necks versus wood ones? Does the sound change? Uh, um, I mean, it can do, but I mean, carbon fiber are great if you. <laughs> Actually, carbon fiber are great because um, I don't have any carbon fiber neck bases, but man, sometimes I wish I did because, um, you know, when the humidity changes and then the, I have to keep doing the changing the truss rod, it does my head in. Uh, do you approach a part classical piece by ear first or, s or s uh, read it? Uh, I read it. <laughs> the Harrow Arrow. Paul Sykes, absolute headbanger. Yeah. Yeah, he started, uh, uh, once, yeah, I won't bore you with it, but the, uh, yeah, I've had one time that he started on me on a bus coming back from Leeds to Wakefield. Uh, he was absolutely off his face on the top deck of the book, uh, on top deck of the bus. He was trying to provoke me so much. I was about 17, uh, maybe 16, and he was stood behind me, a massive cut over his eye. He was about six foot four, and, you know, and he's like, you know, heavyweight, well, he fought for British title. He's a, he's a, he was a great boxer, and like a, just a complete hard nut psychopath. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but um, yeah, I um, 
have got a few tales about Paul Sykes. Everybody that lives in Wakefield's got tales about Paul Sykes. He was a. It wasn't a good person. Do you have any advice on being successful? Oh, but I just saw the cribs are from Wakefield. No, yep. Um, uh, the two brothers. They were uh, when I was teaching at Wakefield College. They were they were at Wakefield College. Um, I was uh, yeah, we're teaching. Uh, so I kind of taught them. Um, they were, but only in the ensemble classes. Um, and I was getting out of the teaching at that point. But uh, yeah, they were there at that point. They were terrible at uh, playing. I mean, they're lovely lads and, and stuff, but uh, and, the, and the cribs are fine, but they're not, uh, you know, obviously you wouldn't consider them like virtuoso technicians, would you? So, they were, you know, being at music college, you know, doing academic music, it wasn't their thing, really. But um, they're... Uh, but they're nice lads in that. How much do you have any advice on being successful in a cruise ship bass player audition? Any songs, genres you recommend practicing? Not really. You just want to get your sight reading up to scratch. Make sure your reading's good. Because if you have to audition for it, they are going to test your reading. Uh, you'll also need to be able to play walking bass lines pretty well. Um, so they'll probably give you a chart, a chord chart, and you're going to have to play walking bass lines through it. You're going to have to read a chart, which will probably be one of the ones from the show. Uh, one of the shows. Um... And they'll give you one of the harder ones from the shows, just to make because they need to make sure that you can do the gig. So, um, yeah. If you're going to be joining, if you're going to be doing it where you're joining a band that's not going to be performing in a theatre, you just need to be. Uh, I mean, you wouldn't have an audition for that though. That's just you'd end up just getting that gig, um, you know, because th that's going to be more like playing in a function band, to be honest. You want to make sure that you're okay with ballroom dancing stuff as well. You want to know how to play quick steps, foxtrots, uh, cha-chas, tangos, um, even old times. If you're going to do a British cruise ship, you want to make sure that you know about old time stuff as well. Um, like Valitas and the Gay Gardens and things like that. Who you got? Nate Diaz or the Russian cat? What, um, Hamzat Chemayev. Um, uh, Hamzat, but It'd be so good if Nate Diaz beat him, you know. And he could. I mean, dude's got a chin, you know. And he's got great jujitsu, so you never know. But I don't know. If he if he tires, if he can tire him out, he might have a chance. It'd be so funny if Nate beats him because he's obviously just been fed to Hamzat, you know, because it's his last fight. But they, uh, if he if he can pull that off... That'd be that'd be wicked. Johnny Marr played with those scally bags for a bit. Uh, for a bit, yeah, he did. Yeah. What would you recommend for someone who wants to play more cleanly, be more accurate, faster, etc.? Practice, sure, but I need more structure than just play, randomly playing things. Um, that's why I've just been going through all of that prelude stuff. That's the kind of stuff that will really improve all of that. And to be fair, a lot of it just comes with with practice and experience. Um, you know, how I played after 10 years versus the first 10 months or the first year it was like, I was like nothing like, you know, like after five years. So it, five years in, I was a completely different bass player to what I was 10 years in to 15 years to 20 years. I've been playing what now, 32 years. It's like I'm a completely different player to what I was back then. To be honest, technically, I'm nothing compared to with what I used to be because um, I just don't practice like I used to do. Do you have a favorite bass player? No, I don't. Uh, my infield is a carbon fiber neck. Yep, th this is an infield, but it's not got a carbon fiber neck. Um, oh, there's a few people with infields. That's cool. Mine must have been uh, selling a few bases. <laughs> Uh, my 1988 white streamer isn't neck heavy may the change yeah some of them are neck heavy some of them aren't some of them are very heavy bodied as well and you know it just changes from uh, model to model I uh, don't consider myself a beginner but when it comes to notes and chords and theory I'm completely zero is your beginner program teach these things um, no but if you want to do that you want to do the chord tone essentials course that that and the s simple steps to sight reading course those two if you do those two courses all of the things that you just mentioned will be fixed. The beginner course is for absolute beginners. So beginner bass guitar is for people that have never touched a bass before. And it's only 10 lessons. It's like basically an introduction to playing bass. Basic fundamentals is the next one up from that. And that's just like a, 
teaching you the absolute basics of other stuff like how to do a setup, how to, um, you know, basics of technique, uh, basics of reading music, basics of, of theory, basics of changing your strings. It's, it's basically fundamental stuff that you learn in the first couple of years. Um, but in terms of theory and learning about chord construction principles and harmony and stuff like that, that's where Chord Tone Essentials comes in. And that teaches you everything you need to know on that scale, uh, uh, scale on that side of things. Uh, and then Simple Steps of Cyrodiil will completely change the way that you look at the bass. So you'll know every note on the bass. You'll learn how to read music to, uh, from absolute beginner through to advanced professional level. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Okay, I'll be going in a couple of seconds. Um, really appreciate the pivoting directions. It solves a big problem for me. Yep, pivoting is the way. So if you've not seen it, so if you're new to the uh, to the lesson, I did talk about it a lot. It's pivoting with the thumb, being able to get, you know, be able to move around the neck by using the thumb pivot. Would the Technique Builder fill that as well? Uh, which question was it that I was answering then for Brian? Uh, oh, uh, yes, it would. Yeah, yeah, the Technique Builder would. So Technique Builder and the Prelude, I mean, they're all cheap, those courses. Uh, technique Builder's cheaper than the average course, and so and the Preludes are cheap as well. So to try all those for the price of one normal course, you better get all three of those because they're pretty cheap. And there's quite a lot of practice material in it. I purposely put those lower because I, I know that there's sort of a, a price point that's missing because everything's like $110, you know. Um, so I wanted some like stuff for people that, that just want a, a quick, um, well, not a quick thing, but like something that's a, well, just a little bit cheaper. So that's um, where those came in. That's not why I did them. I was going to do those anyway, but it just so happened that because they're smaller uh, subjects, uh, you know, just doing a piece. It's not like learning how to read music. That's a huge, long, you know, years of study kind of thing. Do you offer private lessons? No, not anymore. I used to do, but I just don't have time now. Point her in next weekend for a nice pint of stout, Mark. Yep. Let's see if Sade, David, I can miss the king. <laughs> yeah, that might be, but David Icke didn't go in there. He lives in Ride, does uh, David Icke. You ever talked to David Icke when at McDonald's on the island? <laughs> can you see the chat? Yes, I can. I'm talking to it right now. Um, if you just had one hour to jam with one other musician living or pastor, would it be? Uh, probably Frank Zappa. Okay, so I'll leave it there. And... Um, Nice to see everybody. Uh, well, not see you. I can't see you, can I? But uh, nice to chat to everybody. And I will um, possibly be doing another one soon. I don't make these a regular occurrence. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, hopefully you've all had a good, uh, a good time there. And you've learned a little bit about pivoting and position shifting. And I will see you all soon. See you later.